molecular forces. Uh, a for molecules with the same molar mass, and I would say plus or minus 5%, so similar if not the same. The order of IMFs is uh, LDF, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and then ion-ion forces. And so a typical question you might get on the homework or on an exam is about rank the following from lowest to highest boiling point, TB. So lowest to highest boiling point is lowest to highest total intermolecular forces. And to help you do the total IMF, it's always important to remember which one is the dominant or largest intermolecular force. So when solving problems, if uh, LDF is the largest one, then, uh, then there will be less than something that also has dipole-dipole, then hydrogen bonding, then ion-ion forces. It gets a little trickier than that, remember, because if there are two things that have LDF, then you have to look at molar mass because two things with LDF, one can have a higher boiling point than the other. Dipole-dipole, if you're looking at dipole-dipole and you have two things that you think are both dipole-dipole, which almost never happens, by the way, but if it did, the way to tell them apart is, so delta electronegativity, the larger difference in electronegativity leads to a larger IMF and a higher boiling point. Hydrogen bonding, so uh, again, almost never run into cases where you have two things that are hydrogen bonding, but if you did, you would look to the total number of hydrogen bonds for, per molecule. So if one has one hydrogen bond and the other molecule can form two hydrogen bonds with other molecules, then the one with two hydrogen bonds possible per molecule would be larger. And ion-ion forces trends is something we're about to talk about. Um, then, but a typical problem, rank the following from lowest to highest boiling point. So our analysis goes something like this. So nonpolar or anything that contains just carbons and hydrogens. So only LDF and LDF as its dominant or largest. IMF. Here we have CH3CHO. We're not sure what that looks like, or maybe we are, but if you're not sure, always draw the Lewis structure. Lewis structure for this I know I pencil it in kind of didn't really leave myself enough space. So this one has C double bond O. It does not have oxygen bonded to an a covalently bonded to a hydrogen. It cannot have hydrogen bonding. This is dipole dipole forces. Here we have an OH on the end, that's an alcohol. And you're going to have Lewis structures drawn for you on the homeworks and definitely the exams. There may be some homework problems where I give you names and you have to Google them uh, or look them up or use what you've been taught in the class to figure out what the Lewis structure is. All right, uh, we have an O with a pair of electrons. We have an H covalently bonded to an O. This can hydrogen bond with other molecules of itself Oop, well, the dominant one is up top for some of them. And I don't know what this is, or maybe you're wondering what this is, but the thing to key in on, it has a lithium, it has a metal, it has a lithium ion. This, I don't care what it is, if it's got a metal ion in it, if it's got a metal in it, it's gonna be an ionic compound and have ion-ion forces. So when it says rank the following from lowest to highest boiling point, so uh, let's call four 
has the highest boiling point. That's ion ion. Three is going to be hydrogen bonding. Two is going to be dipole dipole forces. And one, nonpolar LDF. Okay. And so that's the kind of analysis we're going to ask you to do on um, the exams. So you're going to have to be able to look, draw Lewis structures, interpret polar versus nonpolar. That's where we're going. So that's the first thing is that just the types of questions we're going to ask. And on exams, what I've found is the best way to do this is just to ask you two at a time. So you won't be ranking four, except on the homework to get an idea of how to work them. Next detail about the intermolecular forces. For large molecules, nonpolar forces, those are LDF, can be large enough to cause a substance to be a solid. So my example is C20H42. If we were to draw something with 20 carbons here, and I'll save us the time of doing that, we would be uh, extremely long, let's see, so it'd be like a long squiggly molecule like that with hydrogens off to the side. If you think about another one of those next to it, there are lots of opportunities, lots of surface area of interaction. Four LDF, which leads to lots of LDF and therefore this is a solid at room temperature. Uh, on a per instance basis, LDF is the weakest, but just like we saw with DNA and hydrogen bonds, get enough of them together and uh, you can turn nonpolar substances solid or have them be solid. See, ionic forces are always the largest. So hands down, they have the biggest charges Remember, hydrogen bonding is just a large version of dipole-dipole. These have partial charges, permanents, that's less than full permanent charges, and then nonpolar has uh, random fluctuations leading to instantaneous dipoles. Those are the weakest. Now, um, let's talk some more about uh, trends in ionic forces. And these are the same as the trends in the strength of ionic bonds. To do that, we'll relate to something in physics like we have done in the past. This is going to be Coulomb's law in terms of energy. Between two charges. And... Q in chemistry, lowercase q, means two things to us. It means an amount of energy when we're talking about thermochemistry. And when it's, we're talking about charges, it is the charge. So the equation goes like this. The E, the energy between two charges, is equal to a proportionality constant K times Q1 times Q2. And so we're going to talk about the product of charges. Those are two things multiplied together. So our charges are here, and there's a product of charges. R is going to be the distance between the two charges. And distance between two charges will be related to ion size for us. So if you've ever dealt with this version of Coulomb's law before, maybe that will help. Otherwise, uh, you will have to know the two trends to do homework and exam questions for this chapter. First trend now, ionic forces are proportional to the product of the ionic charges. As an example of this, we might think of sodium chloride as compared to calcium oxide. 
And uh, if we looked at uh, the charges, we would uh, remember that calcium, or sorry, sodium is plus one, chloride is minus one. Calcium plus two, oxide minus two. So now we do the product of charges. Minus one, that's one times minus one, and minus four, okay? And so uh, what we're going to say is then that ion-ion ion forces, those are the also called ionic bonding, the strength of attraction between a positive and a negative uh, ion. Ion-ion forces are four times stronger for calcium oxide than sodium chloride. And that's actually a very good rule of thumb. The actual numbers, which we won't be talking about in this lecture outline, are uh, pretty close to this. This is a very good trend. The minus sign uh, for us is going to mean that these are forces of attraction meaning there are four times the forces of attraction between calcium and oxide ions than there are sodium and chloride. The negative sign, think of it again, as energy that this, um, uh, so minus four is four times as big and four times as attractive in lowering the energy for the calcium and oxide ions. This is the principal trend always look to this trend first. There is a second trend dealing with the distance, and that is that ionic forces are proportional to one over the size of the ions. Okay, and as an example, uh, the first thing we will say is uh, only do this for when the product of charges is the same. But it often happens. And so let's take a look at sodium chloride, uh, potassium chloride and cesium chloride. And of course, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at product of charges. Well, let's list the charges. Sodium, uh, potassium, and cesium are all in group one. Chloride, of course, is always minus one. So product of charges, always minus one. Now, we can see that the chloride ion is constant here so its size is constant, but now we look at the relative size of the cation. And that's gonna be Na plus potassium. Uh, remembering our size trend, our size trend goes like this. And we remember our size trend for atoms mostly, but as we go to the left and as we go down, the sizes of atoms gets bigger. These are all plus one ions. And we talked about it briefly, but since they're all ions, the trend is still correct. They've all lost one electron. So as you go from sodium to potassium to cesium, they get bigger the ions as well. And that's, again, good for ions of the same charge. If they have different charges, things get trickier. So sodium is the smallest. Uh, cesium is the largest amongst these three. And what we're saying here is since it's proportional to one over the size of the ions, the ion-ion forces are largest for sodium chloride and smallest for cesium chloride. Okay. So two trends in ionic uh, for ion-ion forces 
also two trends in ionic bonding strength as well. And, and ionine force and then ionic bond are two names for the same thing. Okay, so that's the main four, and those are always the answers for boiling point questions for all those properties we started out in lecture, outline 11, video one, talking about. And then I sort of separated solubility, and I'm gonna come back to this picture that we've seen before of the hydration shell of solvent water molecules around an ion, and talk a little bit about how this affects solubility. Um, and first off, again, when you're talking of ion dipole forces, the only question you can ever answer, and I hardly ever ask it, but if I do, is about solubility. And for uh, what's going to happen is that the ion dipole force is going to be important in allowing ionic compounds to dissolve in water. And as noted down here, plus one, minus one ionic compounds, there's enough of these partial negatives and partial positives that when you form a hydration shell, ion dipole forces can generally overcome the ion ion forces and cause plus one, minus one compounds to dissolve. And that's like a quick and dirty summary of your solubility rules, by the way. It's not 100% accurate, because there are some plus one, minus ones that are insoluble. There are also some other compounds with other charges that are uh, soluble as well. But what this is gonna say is plus one, minus one tends to be soluble. Plus two, minus two. Plus three, minus three. So we said plus two, minus two have four times the ion ion forces. That's gonna be too much for these partial water hydration shells to rip apart or overcome the charges. So tend to be insoluble. Now, um, more about solubility. Uh, Nonpolar compounds are what are called hydrophobic. Hydro means water, phobic means fearing. They are not generally soluble in water, and hydrophobic compounds uh, are almost always nonpolar. Okay. Polar compounds, which have dipole dipole forces, are hydrophilic, water loving. And they are generally soluble in water, and so the end result that I like to remember for solubility is like dissolves like. And that means that nonpolar compounds tend to dissolve in each other. This is a very good gasoline that goes in automobiles, it tends to be uh, a mixture of nonpolar compounds, all of which dissolve in each other. We'd hate for one of them to become insoluble and then clog up our gas tank, gas lines, etc. cetera. Uh, nonpolar compounds tend to dissolve in each other. Uh, polar and plus one, minus one ionic compounds tend to dissolve in each other too. And if you've ever heard of water as the universal solvent,
It is not universal, but uh, it, it refers to the fact that a great many things dissolve in water. Nonpolar things do not, and plus two minus two plus three minus three ionic compounds do not. But most often, those are not the things we're interested in. Okay. Now, there's a couple other properties that we mentioned. We want to mention these relatively quickly. Uh, and the reason is that uh, besides boiling and freezing points or melting points, there are a whole host of properties that are very important and related to intermolecular forces. Uh, surface tension or surface energy. So that's what allows a paperclip to float on water. Water has a surface energy of 72.8 millijoules per meter squared. Those are millijoules. And if you've ever seen water bugs float on water um, as well. So uh, what we've said is that uh, substances with larger intermolecular forces like water have larger intermolecular forces and will have larger surface tensions or surface energies. So, and that is what we see here with the trend between uh, what's called uh, hexadecane, 16 carbons. This is nonpolar. Only LDF. This is polar, larger intermolecular forces. Um, and surface tension, very interesting property. I wish we could have a whole course just on it. I have taken whole courses just on it. It's what makes water droplets spherical. Uh, the amount of surface energy is related to the fact that there's a difference between interior molecules and surface molecules as far as the type of intermolecular forces that go on. Anyway, fascinating topic. What you have to remember is that higher surface tensions are for higher intermolecular force um, uh, strengths in general, total intermolecular forces. Another interesting property, viscosity, the resistance of a fluid to flow. So uh, high viscosity means thick. Substances or slow to flow substances. Uh, maple syrup is one example. Uh, oil, which we're about to talk about, is thicker than water. Um, and IMF, greater IMFs lead to greater resistance to flow, so thicker. And uh, longer molecules have greater resistance to flow as well. And this has an application to viscosity in multi-grade motor oils. Viscosity, very important to control the viscosity of your motor oil and keep it there, for, and especially be able to set the viscosity depending upon the age of your motor and the condition of it. Thinner motor oils have different ratings, uh, but what's one of the things that's very important is that as your motor oil goes from sitting around with your car off to the operating temperature, that the viscosity stays the same. The lubricating ability also stays the same. And uh, what I found interesting is that um, a specific type of motor oil called 10W40, multi-grade, with long polymer chains in them. So 90% long polymer chains, less than, and so long polymer chains might be equivalent to the picture we drew before uh, of C20, 20, 20 carbons, except long polymer chains have thousands of carbons long in them. And then there's less than 10% polymethyl methacrylate Polymethyl methacrylate coils at lower temperatures, and a coil might look something like this. We've got two coils, and the coils have a minimum surface area between them. So uh, when they're coiled up, they have minimal surface area, minimal IMF. Then, as the other hydrocarbon chains warm up, their viscosity decreases as they start moving. They have less time, if you will, to have the interactions, the intermolecular forces. 
these polymer chains open and you get more viscosity here. So as temperature increases, so these uh, uncoil and have more uh, higher IMF at the exact time that these polymer chains, as they warm up, they get slightly less viscosity, slightly less thick. And by matching these two, uh, you can have viscosity that is the same at uh, all of your operating temperatures or within a very narrow band of viscosities. Anyway, there's so many interesting applications that you will be able to handle uh, once you understand intermolecular forces. It's the high point of the class. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to teach these to you. Two other things, capillary action. That's the ability of a liquid to flow up a thin tube against the influence of gravity. Uh, balance of two forces, cohesive versus adhesive. Lots to say there. However, capillary action gets larger for larger IMF. Uh, and you'll start to hear about microfluidic reactors. These have very tiny tubes in which there are no motors that are drawing the fluids through these tubes. It is strictly capillary action. So you get it there through these tubes and then they interact on this chip that is approximately the size of a dime through capillary action. So many interesting things that relate to intermolecular forces. These are but a few.